God is not finished with audacious church yet. People say to me all the time, you must be thrilled with where God, what God is doing. I am, but I'm so, so, so thankful that God is not finished yet. You know, I was just chatting with a friend this week and uh, he runs a church, oh, he's involved in a church of around 40, 50,000 people on a weekend. And sadly, his father-in-law, the, uh, the founding pastor of that local church, recently passed away at the age of just 57 years of age. We were reflecting on how short a life that was and my dad passing away at 61 years of age. And my friend made this comment, God does not judge our lives like we do. Many people on the planet, we judge lives by longevity, but God judges our life according to purpose. And one of the great verses of the Bible in Acts 13, 36, it says this, David served the purposes of God in his generation and then he died. There's almost that sense that you and I, we are invincible until we've done what God has called us and equipped us to do. So I wanna thank every single one of you for living out your God purpose in your world, wherever you are, whatever you do in business and in work, God has called you according to His purpose. And together we'll see significant things. Well, I don't know if you know the story of Larry Walters. Larry Walters, the story goes like this, a true story, that down in California some years ago, back in around 1982, 83, Larry Walters had a dream. He was a trucker. He drove trucks, but he had a dream that one day he would fly. The dream was a crazy dream. He tried out for the US Air Force, but because of his poor eyesight, he was not allowed to become a pilot in the Air Force. So one day, while sitting in the back garden in his deck chair, drinking a few beers, he thought, I wonder if I can really fly. He and his wife hatched a plan. They went to a shop and and, and under the guise of a scientific experiment, they bought 45 weather balloons. He said to his buddies in the neighbourhood, I'm going to fly tomorrow. The next day, they, they tied this deck chair to the floor. They filled 45 helium balloons, our weather balloons with helium, they counted down. He had with him a camera. He had with him a pellet gun to shoot the balloons when he got to around 100 or 200 feet. And he had a case of beers. They counted down. They cut the ropes that tethered this deck chair to the ground. You can Google it. You can see live footage of it. And they counted down. They cut the ropes. It began to lift 100 feet, 200 feet, 1,000 feet. At about 2,000 feet, he dropped his beers. He dropped the camera. And true story, this man, Larry Walters, in a deck chair, evened out at 15,000 feet. 15,000 feet. Two commercial airliners coming into land at an airport in California radioed into air traffic control. We've just passed a man in a deck chair. <laughs> air traffic control, like, have you been drinking? They ended up having to shut down the airport. They had to divert planes. And at some point later, about 45 minutes later or so, finally he landed. His, his, the balloons got caught up in power lines, but thankfully he was okay. He arrived uh, hundreds of miles away from home. When he landed, the police were waiting to arrest him for illegally flying and CNN interviewed him. <coughs> they said, Larry, what made you think you could fly? And his answer was simple. Well, you just can't sit there. (laughs) What a profound statement. You just can't sit there. You have to do something. Now, I wonder if you're like me, if, if you ever find yourself asking yourself the question, will I ever not need a miracle? A miracle is God doing what only God can do. Because I guess if you are like me, there are two parts to you. There's the part of you that really wants comfort. To have enough, to be just enough, to not have to get out of bed early again and believe for something more again. That, that, that there's a side of all of us that is going for comfort, but there's also a part of all of us that is yearning for more. And I wonder, what is that part of us that's always yearning for more? Some would say it's because humankind is selfish. I don't think so. 
I don't think there's a yearning in all of us for something more because we're selfish. I think it actually reflects God's heart for you and I. Look at these two of many verses in Scripture. Proverbs 15, 24. The path of life leads upwards for the wise. So if you are wise and you make enough wise decisions in life, number one, who you marry, who you have a relationship with, what you do with your time, your diligence, your your decision making, if you are wise long enough, your life will wind upwards. Deuteronomy 30 verse nine, the Lord your God will make you successful in everything you do. Not in everything you don't do, but in everything you do. So I wanna suggest for all of our campuses, Chester, Manchester, I wanna suggest right now that the reason you need a miracle in your life, the reason you need a miracle in business, finance, family, in health, relationships, the reason we need a miracle for our new cathedral that we're building here in Manchester and the miracle of expansion and increase in Chester, the reason we need a miracle is simply because God is wanting us to embrace something new and go for something more. If you were happy to be where you were at, you wouldn't need to believe God for a miracle. But the reason there's a yearning on the inside for something new, for increased favour, for greater opportunity, for more success in the workplace, for happiness and health in your family is because you need a miracle yearning for more. But I want you to know this church, that the key to the miracle right now is already in your hand. You don't need to look any further. You don't need to go on another self-help course. We don't need to get another little bit of wisdom. God has already given you and I the key that we need for the miracle. The key is in our hands. If you're in business right now and you're thinking, man, I'm struggling to make ends meet to find a way forward. I need a miracle. Get this, the key to the miracle is already in your hand. I'm gonna do a spoiler alert, tell you what it is, then we're gonna break it down and then we're gonna eat Nando's for lunch in Jesus' Name. Here's the key to the miracle. Hebrews 11, verse one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Now faith. Come on, say it with me. Now faith. Now faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Hebrews 11, verse six says this. Without faith, It is impossible to please God. Faith is now, and also we need faith to please God. Let's jump into a story in Mark chapter two for a few moments. We're gonna draw out a few truths from this. Mark chapter two, verse one. A few days later, when Jesus was entering Capernaum again, the people heard that Jesus had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and Jesus preached the Word to them. Some men came, bringing to Him a paralysed man. Uh, One translation said a paralytic. Uh, I had somebody come up to me once and say, was he drunk? He wasn't drunk, he couldn't walk. Not because of the drink, he was just paralysed, carried by four of them. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, They made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralysed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in His spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts and He said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, he took his mat and he walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God in Chester, in Manchester and beyond, saying, we have never seen anything like this. I want you to know, church, right now, with whatever it is, whatever the miracle is, I want you to know that the key is faith. Can I say it again? The key 
is faith. That nothing really ever happened in the kingdom of God without faith. Faith is the currency of heaven. And the thing about faith is this, is that faith requires us to do something. You see, here's the thing we've got to learn. That if you are facing something, you can't do nothing. Nothing has no substance. Nothing has no life. Nothing has no seed. Nothing has no substance. You can't go to something with nothing and expect something in return. That's not the way life works. That's not the way God planned life and faith to work. I used to often do this when I was in school. I hated physics. I'd go to bed at night and I'd get on my knees before I prayed. I'd say, God, if you love me tonight, please make a pixie, an angel, a fairy. Heck, I'm desperate, even a demon to come into my room and do my physics homework. And then I'd jump in bed. And I'd always wake up the next day disappointed that nothing had happened with my something. And I soon learned this, that in order for something to happen, I have to learn the lesson that I have to do something. Church, nothing will happen if you do nothing. With that obstacle, with that challenge, with that miracle, with that breakthrough, I really believe that God is speaking to every single one of us and say, you have to learn, Glenn. We have to learn, church, to do, come on, something. Many people say, well, Pastor Glenn, you know what? I'm just waiting on the Lord. That's what I'm doing. I'm waiting on the Lord. We quote verses like Isaiah 40, verse 31. Those who wait upon the Lord. So what I'm doing is this. I'm I'm waiting. I'm just waiting for a miracle. I'm waiting for a breakthrough. I'm waiting for that new job. I'm waiting for the right girl to walk into my world. I'm waiting for the right boy to walk into my world. I'm just waiting as though waiting is passive. As though waiting is like standing on the East Lanks, waiting for the bus to come by. You can't do anything, you're just waiting. But I want you to see here in Scripture, if you can go back to that verse, that waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. Look at what it says. It says, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Do you know how you renew your strength? You don't renew your strength by doing nothing. When I was running some years ago, five, six years ago, and I pulled my Achilles, I thought, fantastic, six weeks off. I'm gonna lie down, my wife's gonna have to bring me breakfast in bed. I'm gonna get lunch in bed, dinner in bed. Heck, I'm gonna stay in bed for six weeks. This is gonna be awesome. And the doctor says, no, son. If you wanna get strength, you've gotta use the very thing. I wanted to wait. He said, no, you gotta get back to the gym. You gotta work the very thing that you're hoping will get better. See what it says? They'll renew their strength. That means going to the gym. They shall mount up, that's climbing. On wings, that's flying. Uh, They shall run, that's running. They shall walk, that's walking. But it's not doing nothing. And so if you're telling me I'm waiting on God, I'm gonna quote to you what James says in the New Testament. He says, I show you my faith by what I do. You see, faith is not doing nothing. Faith is learning to do, come on, something. God wants us to be a people who learn again what it is in His presence to do something. And as I focus my attention just right now on our new cathedral here in Manchester, and as I focus our attention for Chester on the continued refurbishment, can I speak to Chester and say this? We need more kids space in Chester. The dream that we have together is that we would see a new floor built across the foyer in that magnificent facility that you've got there. How do we do this? Well, faith requires us to do something, but I wanna break it down and make it so simple even I can understand it. Faith requires us to do something small. Learn to do the small things well. The Bible says, God says, if you are faithful in small things, I will give you much. I believe it's true for us as a local church, as our operations teams and our people work hard in the systems as we're faithful in small things, God can trust us with much. Pastor Mark Steele, wherever he is, who runs the operations of Audacious Church, he is enabling us, there he is on the front row, he is enabling us, Audacious Church, both campuses, he's enabling us to be trusted by God with much 
because his eye is on the detail. If you're faithful in small things, God says, I will give you many things. Can I say, if you're running a business, if you're faithful and diligent in the small things of business, you're faithful and diligent in being faithful, honouring in your quotes, turning up on time, finishing well, doing the job, and even better than what you stated, God says, if you are faithful doing things small, then I can trust you with a lot more. Faith is learning to do something small. Now think about it with me, Mark chapter two. The small conversation that those four boys had. We'll call them Paul, Stuart, Mark, and David. And there they are, they're just hanging around. They got a buddy called Wayne who's paralysed. And one day in conversation, Paul brings up something small. He says, what are we gonna do about Wayne? What are we gonna do about Wayne? And they have just a very small conversation where one of the four says, well, what about Jesus? It didn't seem massive, it wasn't significant, it was small, but what I've discovered with God is this, is God loves to take small things. You see, I've learned this lesson over the years that what is small to one person is a lot to another. In the Bible, there's an offering moment where Jesus is watching what people are giving in an offering. He sees a widow come forward, she gives her might just a small coin. To everybody else, it was little, but in God's eyes, it was a lot. Church, I want you to know that this is the way the Kingdom of God works. The Kingdom of God works on the basis that as we commit to doing a little, God commits to doing a lot. But we together have to learn to do something. Can I focus your attention for a moment on the principle of the tithe. Church, I say this for your benefit. I say this because you already know it, because you're generous in your giving. But let me just say this, that when we think about the tithe, I have up here 10 coins, 10 coins. When we think about the tithe, the tithe really is small. To some people, it's a lot. But in reality, when we look at just these 10 coins here on the table, can you see these on camera? Come on over, Mr. Cameraman. When you see these 10 coins, God simply says this, that all I want you to do is give me 10%. Give me one coin. Give me one out of the 10. I'm sure that you'll agree that when you look at 10 coins up here, 10, one doesn't seem like much. But God says this, that if you are faithful in the small things, then watch what I will do. I can do a lot with that little. Now, the reason why for many Christians the tithe feels too much is because we are living beyond our capacity. Our debts are big. Many people living beyond their means and so say, Pastor Glenn, how could I ever give God 10% when I can't even live fully with 100%? But God says this, God says, do something small. This story here on stage that you're seeing with these 10 coins is akin to me being in McDonald's with my children. I'm drinking a coffee, they're drinking their burger and fries. And while I'm just drinking my coffee, I reach across the table to my son's fries. I take one fry and he looks at me and goes, Dad, this is my precious. Dad, you can't have it. And there's always that moment where I'm trying to explain to my son, he's a lot better now, thank God. I'm trying to explain to my son, son, the only reason you have it is because I gave it to you in the first place. If it wasn't for your father, you wouldn't have your fries. Son, can I have a chippy? Okay, Dad. That's really what our tithe is. Our tithe is recognising the only reason why I have Sophia is because God gave her to me in the first place. 
The only reason why I have my two beautiful children, the only reason why I have my friends and my church family is because God gave it to everything that exists in my world exists because God gave it to me. And so when it comes to the tithe, God often says, will you trust me in the small? Because if you trust me in the small, you watch what I can do with that small. Married for 22 years, never missed tithing. Started tithing when I got my pocket money as a child. And I can tell you this, that when it comes to the small thing of tithing, friends, you and I have a choice. We can live in two places. We can either live in Struggle Street or we can live in Faith Boulevard. Now the reality is this, is that many people make a choice, I'm gonna live in Struggle Street. But here's the thing about Struggle Street. One of the things I've been become aware of in my time of living in the United Kingdom is that people move houses to change postcodes to go to the right school. We gotta get our son in that school. We gotta get our daughter in that school. The house where we're living is great, but we're gonna have to change our whole life in order to move postcodes so we can access that school. Friend, let me tell you what the tithe is. The tithe is making the decision, I don't wanna live in a postcode where Struggle Street is, I wanna live in a postcode called Faith Boulevard. And what I, what I can tell you, hands down, time and time again in our life of tithing, doing the small thing, putting God first. Have we been through difficult times? You bet you we have. But now I feel a little bit like David in the Old Testament who said this, I was young, now I'm old, and I have never seen the righteous forsaking or begging for bread. Something happens when we learn to do the small thing. You find yourself no longer always looking at the bank account, always looking for opportunity, always struggling to find favour. You find yourself now, is it true, Pastor Paul? You're now living in a new postcode called Faith Boulevard where you don't know how and you don't know why. You don't know why those things came to pass. Even through the difficult times, you still look back and say, wow, God, you were faithful and God, you were good. But I wanna tell you something. I would much rather do the small and live in Faith Boulevard without the emotion and the stress and the anxiety of trying to make ends meet. I would rather do something small, take a step back and watch God bring a miracle. Now I'm preaching this to you because you already know it, but I'm just giving you the theology of why you do what you do. The amount of Christians I met on the planet who still don't get this biblical principle, this scripture. Believe in God for big miracles, but won't do something small. Because here's the thing, folks. If you want a miracle, you have got to do Come on, you have got to something. You see, back in, 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 in the Old Testament, the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth. Now, whether that was a six day process or took a long time is not the conversation for now. But God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible says there was nothing and God made everything. He created what we call Ex nihilio, Latin for out of nothing. There was nothing, God made something. You know the story, do you, of the clever scientists who went to God. They said, God, anything you can do, we can do better. We can do anything better than you. God said, no, you can't. Yes, we can. No, you can't. Yes, we can. No, you can't. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. So God says to the clever scientists, okay, clever scientists, what about a duel? The clever scientist said, no problem, God. And God said, here is the duel. You have to make a man. The clever scientist said, no problem, God. We can clone a sheep called Dolly. We can definitely make a man. God said there are two conditions to this duel. Condition number one, you have to use what I used in the beginning when I made man, I used dust. And the clever scientist said, no problem, God. They bent down to pick up some dust and God said, hey, condition number two, get your own dust. Because when God created the heavens and the earth, He created ex nihilio, He created out of nothing. Now let me say this, the only time God ever had to do something out of nothing was in the beginning. 
From that moment, in Genesis chapter one, it says this, I give you every seed bearing plant. Speaking to a farmer about reproduction, about increase, I, I, I give you that verse to let you know this. God will not do something from your nothing. He's given you seed. Can I say, and I'm using tithing as an illustration today because you already know this. I'm just giving you the theology. Your tithe is seed for the miracle. Every Sunday, every month when I give online, when I put my offering in, I'm putting in my seed for the miracle. I'm saying, God, I'm believing for increase. I'm believing for favour. I'm believing for opportunity. I'm believing for good health. I'm believing for my children. I'm believing for my friends. I'm believing for my business investments. I'm believing for our church. This every single time is a seed. I wish every Christian on the planet knew this. Because without the seed, friend, We live in Struggle Street. Can I encourage you, do something small. Forgiveness is a small thing. It seems like a big thing, but it's actually a small thing. Let's be forgivers, let's be givers, let's be kind, let's be generous, let's be honoring. These small things bring a great dividend to our lives. So not only do I wanna encourage you to do something small, but I wanna encourage you, church, to do something audacious. Oh, come on, you should be way more excited than that. I know I've just been talking about money, which is squeaky bum tea time in the English church, but you know me, I know you. Let me say it again. I believe we should do something audacious. It's a great word, audacious. I, I love the story in Mark chapter two. These boys, they decided to break open somebody's roof. Now, I ain't even got time to really just preach on that truth, but they broke open Every time I was a child and I broke my next door neighbor's windows with cricket balls and things like that and boomerangs, I gotta be honest, never once did I have a neighbor come and say, thank you for breaking my window. (laughs) They broke somebody's roof. Some would call it stupid. We call it audacious. Now, there's a fine line between stupid and audacious. That fine line is whether or not it works. If that paralyzed man was just lying on the ground, it would definitely be stupid. Everybody goes home and poor old Wayne's on the floor going, fellas, help. (laughs) Audacious, it means this, it means to be bold, daring, dangerous, fearless, unrestrained by convention, to challenge assumptions, to be free spirited and to be original. Church, let me just say this, that this is the church that you are in that you are always in an environment when you're in an audacious church, an environment of faith. We will empathize with your difficulties, but we will stand with you in faith to believe for a miracle. I love this definition here of audacious. It's everything Jesus was. So I ask you this question. What would somebody who is truly audacious, what would somebody who is truly audacious do in your shoes? And so as we draw our attention again to the vision party in November, another chance to sow into the vision offering. We put it out there, 4,000 chairs for Manchester, 400 chairs for Chester. We put it out there, 1,000 pounds per chair. We'll get us 4,000 chairs, enable us to get on the journey of building a 24 million pound facility here and investing 400,000 pounds in Chester. And we said to the church, church, let's be audacious. If you remember, we gave four points according to that. One of the points was this, be radical, not reckless. Reckless is when we give out of emotions, we give out of pressure. Reckless is when we give on credit. Radical is when we hear the voice of God. So within that journey, God spoke to Sophie and I about giving a year's salary over two and a half years into the building offering. And uh, when God spoke to Sophie and I, we got a thought burned hot in both our hearts that we should put a year's salary into this building fund. We had what I call the wrestle of faith. Happened in the Old Testament with a man called Jacob. The Bible says that Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. He, 
he, he wrestled with the Lord. The Bible says he wrestled with him all night, which seems like a short time. Because sometimes when God speaks to me about things, that wrestle goes for a lot longer than one night. And at the end of that wrestle, the Bible says the angel of the Lord hit his hip, smacked his hip. And from that moment on, Jacob walked with a limp. Everything about that wrestle of faith changed the way he walked and lived. And I guess for Sophie and I, we could say absolutely and honestly, when God challenged us about putting a year's salary in, we thought, wow, really? We realised we had to change everything. We changed our budget, we cut our budget, our expenses down drastically. <coughs> we started to give into God, into the Kingdom of God. And we found that as we gave our little, God did a lot. I mean, the really exciting thing for us is that as of a month ago, we have already, after two years, given one whole year's salary into the building fund, which means this, that everything we do between now and the end of the building project, this particular capital campaign in May, is over and above. God's done it. But I'll tell you how God did it. God did it because we kept sowing a seed. So I wanna ask you, church, both here and Chester, I wanna ask you, what did God speak to you regarding sowing into the building offering? the vision offering. What did God say? The Bible says this in Proverbs 16, verse nine. It says, we should make plans. Because here's the thing. Not only should we do something small, not only should we do something audacious, but I believe we should do something now. I guess for us in the church, it would have been a lot easier for us to wait for another 10 years before we launched the cathedral plan here for Manchester would have been a lot easy for us to not even launch Chester. Eight years ago, we planted a church into Krakow, into Poland. And I was there just last week for two days during the week speaking to their leaders. How cool is this? Some pastors came from Czech Republic. They have the largest church in Czech Republic. They came to a leader session we did. We had people come from all around Poland, all around Hungary to spend 24 hours as we spoke leadership and we shared faith. But none of that would have happened if you and I together eight years ago hadn't thought, you know what? We haven't got the human resources, the financial resources. Poland needs Jesus, but let's let Poland, let's leave Poland to Poland. No, no, no. Together we thought, you know what? We've got to do something now. The thing about faith I want you to get, church, is that faith is now. Which is why Hebrews 11 says this, now faith. Now faith. Faith is now. Get this, faith is not for tomorrow. That's why Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, He says, do not worry about tomorrow. Do you know why He says that? It's because you're not in tomorrow. Faith is for now. It's not for tomorrow. I do find, however, that when I wake up tomorrow, now I've got faith. Because faith is now. But the Bible says this in Proverbs 16, 9, we should make plans. So as I direct your attention again to our collective small in order to do something big, what plans did you make before God for the cathedral, for the expansion opportunities in Chester? What plans did you make? Because the Bible says we should make plans. And while we're faithful in the small things and we're giving stuff to God as a seed, it's amazing what happens when you find yourself positioned in Faith Boulevard. Miracles come left, right and centre. Miracles you didn't expect. Miracles you didn't even pray for. Miracles come, come to pass simply because you positioned yourself for the miracle. In order for the miracle, I have to do something. I love how Proverbs puts this. We should make plans. We should make plans. And maybe your plans have changed over the last two years. Or maybe you're new into the Life of Audacious Church and you're thinking, Glenn, I didn't really even know about the cathedral giving opportunity. I didn't really know about the expansion opportunities across in Chester, but you wanna be a part of that. The Bible says we should make plans. Seriously, we've had hundreds and hundreds of amazing stories in this offering campaign. So many, so many. One of my favourites is of a, a pensioner in Chester campus who gave this, said this to Pastor Emily. He said this, he said, I live on a pension 
He said, but I have determined in my heart that over this building campaign, I am gonna buy one chair. And he said this, if I can do it on my pension, then everybody can do it with the seed that God has given them. Isn't that a great story? Faith requires us to do something now. So church, in order to see a miracle, we've got to put something in God's hands. In order to see a miracle, we've got to plant the seed. In order to see a miracle, we've got to do something. Maybe in your family, maybe family is fractured, family's in a difficult situation. Can I just say this? You've got to do something. Maybe changing your mind on a decision that you've made that is bringing difficulty in your family life. Maybe just changing your mind, just doing that one something. Maybe your one act of forgiveness in your family is enough to bring change, to bring a miracle of unity and harmony there. You're asking God for a miracle. God says, do something in Jesus' Name. Church, I'm asking you again that over these next few weeks as we think and as we pray, focusing on our vision party on November the 18th, that you stand with us together as a local church. We need you to do something. Why do we need you to do something for this offering campaign? Why do we need you to stand with us in faith? I'm gonna put four reasons up here on screen. The four reasons why we need you to do something with us is because your church family is. Be a part of a corporate miracle. Stand with us in faith and do something with us. What I love in this story is this, is Jesus looked to the man and He says, you get up and do something. Before that, Jesus had seen the faith of the four friends, but now He required the man needing the miracle to do something. I ask you to stand with us in faith in giving into our vision party on November the 18th, because there is, like in this story, a paralysis in this nation. The Church of God in this nation is a phenomenon. The Church of God globally is a phenomenon. One great preacher says the, the church is the hope of the world, the light and the love and the magnificence of Jesus Christ coming through all of our hearts. I believe that the local church can bring change. Did you know universities began in local churches? Did you know hospitals came out of local churches? Did you know schools came out of local churches? The history, 2000 years, so many life and nation transforming things happened because of the local church. I believe that together we can see a paralysis changed. I wanna say, stand with us in faith because what you do may seem small, but our collective small, God can do something great. My prayer being that on the day when we cut the tape here in Manchester on our new cathedral, on that day where in the future in Chester, we launch new expressions of Audacious Church through into North Wales and the Wirral, down through into Cheshire, our collective small will be able to celebrate something big. And the fourth reason is this, is because there is a chair waiting for your friend. We're buying chairs to make it possible for our friends and family to come to faith in Christ. I love how the story finishes in Mark chapter two. It says this, we have never seen anything like this. And that is my prayer for your life, for your business, for your family. My prayer is that something would happen in your life, in your lifetime, that would make those of you around you look at you and say, we did not know it was possible to live a life like that. And my prayer is that corporately, the city, the nation and the nations would look at what God is doing through the people of Audacious Church and say, we never have ever seen anything like this. Church, I believe that you are a city on a hill. I believe that you are a lamp on a lampstand. I believe that God has drawn us, drawn us together to be in church, to truly make a difference. I believe that we can do this together. I believe in you. I believe in the God in you. And I believe that together as we stand in faith, we will see God do amazing things in Jesus' Name.